world. He was massive. He had uh, keys to the high priest. He had letters. He had authority. It was spiritual authority. It was religious authority. And it was all steeped. Check this out. A lot of it was all steeped in the Bible. How about that? And so what happened to Paul? Well, we all know what happened to Paul. One day, he was walking down the road, thinking that his life was going fine. He had it all together. And bang, a light came from heaven. And it was a voice from heaven saying, Paul, I am Yeshua, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Paul was stopped in his tracks. Paul was blind, actually blind. And we know, and we won't go into it, but if you read Galatians chapter one, he will talk about, he gives his testimony what happened. He spent three years here. He spent 14 years here. He had to relearn his theology. He had to throw out all of that authority that he thought was God-given. He had to die to all of that. Listen again. Let's go back to Philippians 3, where he says, uh, uh, Though anyone could have confidence in the flesh, no one more than me. And again, he mentions circumcision, the outward sign of the covenant of God. There's nothing wrong with circumcision. There's nothing wrong with being of the tribe of Benjamin. There's nothing wrong with being a Hebrew of Hebrews or as being a zealous, being a Pharisee. Pharisees, by the way, don't look at Pharisees as bad people. Yes, there were a few bad Pharisees. It's like today. It's like when you hear the name Catholic priest. Okay, what comes to your mind? We all know some of the corruption and some of the, you know, sexual abuse that goes on. But does that mean every Catholic priest is corrupt and perverted? No. I know many, many, many godly Catholic priests, real men of God. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with all their theology, um, but sometimes I don't even agree with my theology. But um, uh, the, the point being is Pharisees in general were very, very godly men. They were zealous for God's law. Where the Pharisees really originated from is when the first temple was destroyed and the Jews returned from Babylon and a, a couple of hundred years later, when Alexander the Great started to bring the Greek culture and civilization into the world, that's when a group of people called the Sanhedrin took a stand and said, we must not allow what happened to us in Babylon to happen to us now. What happened in Babylon? When we were exiled, we mixed among the Babylonians. That was actually one of the Babylonian uh, policies was to assimilate the people that were under their captive. Assimilation is a big strategy of the enemy. And a lot of Jews actually got assimilated into the Greco-Roman way. And well, they adopted Greek names. Josephus Flavius, that is not his Jewish name. Yosef ben Mattathiahu is his Hebrew name. He adopts a, a, a Greek name. The Sadducees, the Herodians, they were the ones who sided with Herod, even though Herod was half Jewish, he was far more Roman than Jewish. But the Pharisees, they basically said, no, we must not allow assimilation to come in. And they became very strong and strict. So if you understand the Pharisees in that context, you'll understand that really they were trying to protect. And it's very similar, actually, if you go to uh, Jewish communities in the United States today. Have a look at the spectrum. 
Have a look at the Orthodox communities. Have a look at the Reform Jewish communities. And you will see a lot of those Reform Jewish communities have totally assimilated. And, uh, you know, uh, Jackie Mason, I'm sure you've heard of the Jewish comedian Jackie Mason. He makes a joke. He says, you know, Reformed Jewish synagogues now are so Reformed that they're closed on Jewish holidays. Okay? You get the joke? That's how Reformed they've become. So, um, uh, 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 what was I saying? I was saying that the Pharisees, um, you know, for the most part, were good people. Nicodemus, Gamliel, great godly men. Nicodemus said, no one can come from God uh, except they do the things that you're doing. Uh, Gamliel, he said, you know, uh, he said to the people that were opposed, he said, look, if, if this is of God, then you're fighting God. If it's not of God, then don't worry about it. It will just fall away like this other uh, uh, false uh, messianic movement. So Paul was big in his world. He had this authority. But isn't it interesting when he was struck down by the Lord on, uh, on the road to, um, uh, to uh, Damascus, uh, his whole world got turned upside down. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing things in the flesh if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a pastor, if you're a rabbi. Paul is talking about putting confidence in the flesh. That was the dividing line here. And the reason why I think that's so important to underscore putting confidence in the flesh is because you know, we also can be given places of authority or even gifts, even spiritual gifts. And if we're putting confidence in ourselves and in our giftings and even in our callings and look, or even in our wisdom, even in our intellectual understanding, uh, this can become a stumbling block to ourselves and to other people. And that's why Paul, he says this, uh, and he gives us a few recipes for advice that he learns. And it comes out of this passage in Philippians chapter 3. The first thing he says is he says, beware of the concession. Beware of those who say, we are the true circumcision. We have the true way. Okay? He warns about, about those. He actually goes on to say, actually, we are the true circumcision. Why? Because we're doing it from the heart. And that's what Paul is getting to here, the heart of the matter. And he, he sees the negative and he sees the positive. He sees the negative where he was put in confidence in the flesh. And then, sorry, yeah, the negative. And then he sees the positive where he says, we are the true circumcision who put no confidence in the flesh. And that is what it means to circumcise ourselves. Anything that becomes fleshly, anything that we have been given that we're holding on to, we're putting confidence in, it can become something very, very even dangerous. Maybe I can give an example of what I'm trying to say. Do you remember when Moses was told by the Lord to go to Pharaoh? What did the Lord say to Moses? Moses, what is in your hand? And uh, he had a rod. And what did the Lord say to Moses? He said, throw it down. So Moses throws it down. And what happened when he threw it down? It turned into a snake. Okay? Now, that was something that the, the Egyptian magicians could also do, but... I think the, the emphasis here is on the snake. Every time in the scriptures that snakes are used, they're usually either connected to the ancient gods, the snake gods, or sin. Sin. Usually snakes are symbolic with sin. When Moses lifted up the serpent and put it on the pole, 
uh, the serpent in the world, in the Garden of Eden, usually symbolic of sin. So when Moses looked out, he saw that rod turned into a serpent. Then what did the Lord say to him? He said, pick it up at the other end. And Moses picked it up at the other end. And that other end was the end that did not bite. That did not bite. And what comes to me when I think of that, that story is that rod, really, when you think about it, it was just something neutral. It was, it was the gift that God was going to use. But the Lord wanted to show Moses that that rod in man's hand if he's not careful and doesn't see that the serpent is hiding behind it, he is behind it. We have to know how to lay it down. And then once we've learned to lay it down, then when God tells us to pick it up again, we pick it up at the end that doesn't bite. It doesn't bite us and it doesn't bite other people. And then Moses had real authority. It wasn't dangerous authority. So uh, Paul says, beware of the concision. Put no confidence in the flesh. That's a hard one. That's a hard one to do, especially in the Greco-Roman Jewish world, where there was so much confidence on the intellect, on the intelligence, on the public speaker. You know, these were the days of Socrates and Aristotle and the great orators, the Stoics that went to the windows and were great orators. <coughs> and they used to all, remember, they used to give their thumbs up or their thumbs down, and they used to get the crowds and the glory of man. Remember when Paul went to Corinth? Incredible. In 1 Corinthians 2, what did Paul say? He said, when I came to you, I did not come to you with excellency of speech, but I came to you timid with fear and trembling so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Paul understood that it had nothing to do with his great preaching, but it was the preaching of the cross. He says in chapter one of 1 Corinthians, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to a world that perishes, but unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. And I think if I can uh, quote Billy Graham, Billy Graham would always say in private interviews that when he preached the cross, he believed that behind the message of the cross was a built-in power. The Holy Spirit would use the message of the cross, which again, is foolishness. And yet God has chosen that tool, the weakness of a man dying on the cross. Uh, another, another piece of advice that Paul gives is about knowing the Lord. Knowing the Lord. You'll notice one thing that Paul says when he says, what things were gained to me, those I counted as loss, as dung. What for? Why? Why did he count it as dung? That I may know the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. See, he knew God's word. He knew Judaism. He knew his spiritual background. He knew the glory of the temple. He knew all that, but he lacked something in his relationship, in his knowledge of God. It's almost like what Jesus said to the, to the scribes and to the, some of the religious people of the day. Remember when he said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that speak of me, but you won't come to me. Isn't that interesting? They knew the scriptures. They spoke about eternal life. And then Jesus said, but they actually speak of me, but you won't come to me. So Paul counted all of these things as loss. Why? 
compared for something greater, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, and he calls him my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but done, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. And that's another thing Paul says. We've got to make sure that we're not like Paul. Paul had a strong sense of righteousness. What he was doing was the right thing. He was deceived. He was actually deceived. When he got struck down and blinded, he realized, I was doing it in my, if we can use this word, in my flesh. He was putting confidence in the flesh. You try telling a radical Muslim who's got an explosive belt strapped to him, you try telling him that he's deceived. There's no way he'll listen to you. He's been programmed. He's been indoctrinated. He's been deceived. He has come under a, an authority that has a belief system that when I die as a shaheed, I am going straight to paradise. I'm going to get my 70 virgins or whatever, plus the 70 mother-in-laws. That you try to convince him that he's deceived and wrong? No way. So Paul talks about uh, uh, this sense of self-righteousness. We need to be so careful when we deal with doing things for the Lord. Are we doing them? Is there a little bit of my own agenda involved here? And, um, and by the way, this is a process. You know, Paul says, I press on. You know, he, 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 uh, he didn't have it uh, all mastered overnight. This is a process that we all go through. Uh, putting no confidence in the flesh counting all things done for the excellency of knowing Christ, my, my Lord. Uh, uh, understanding that the righteousness that we obtain is not based on what we do, but it's the righteousness. And I just see a little note here from Sandra. Thank you. That's exactly what I was going to say. Righteousness that depends on faith alone. You know, there, my understanding of the scriptures is that there's two sides of a coin of righteousness. <clears throat> there's the one side that is a righteousness that is imputed unto us. When we accept the Lord, Jeremiah 23, a messianic prophecy, it says that there will come a ruler. He will rule on the earth and his name, Adonai Tzidkenu, the Lord, my righteousness. So we just accept what he did for us on the cross. He becomes our garment of righteousness. His blood becomes our garment. We are made righteous. That's one side. The other side of the coin is what the book of Revelation says, that the bride of Christ, which is all of us, we make ourselves ready by getting our garments for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what are our garments? John says, the garments are the righteous acts of the saints. But it's the righteous acts that we do, not in our flesh, not in our own strength, but according to the leading of the Spirit. So look, I know all of us are probably mature enough to know most of this. But it's a good reminder when you look at someone like Paul, who was just so full, full and filled with his world, thinking that he had it all right. And believe me, my understanding of Paul, he was a brilliant man. But what happened? He becomes a nobody. He gets totally knocked down on the road to Damascus. And then everything changes over a number of years. Then what happens? He becomes the giant that we know him for. But the giant Paul 
is not the kind of giant that we would think of today. He was a very humble man. He had a thorn in his flesh. He went to Corinth with weakness. He was very, very different to what we might think of as a great man. Remember what John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. By the way, someone told me that um, John the Baptist was a Southern Baptist the, the, a couple of days ago because where he baptized was the Southern part of the Jordan River. So he was a Southern Baptist anyway. Um, but Paul, was, he became a giant for the Lord. And friends, being a giant for the Lord is understanding. Remember, I started this teaching by saying, in original creation, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave Adam and Eve authority. He said, have dominion, rule. But because Satan usurped man, all the way throughout history, man is infected. For God to redeem the world, he had to do it through a man. And this is where the beautiful gospel message comes in. Because when Jesus came and died on the cross, he disarmed the principalities and powers. He died, he was buried, and through resurrection power, the Father gave him the keys Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, and to him, I will give the key to the house of David and whatever he binds shall be bound and whatever he loosens shall be loosed. And what did Jesus say after his resurrection? For 40 days, he went around teaching the things of the kingdom and then standing on a mountain somewhere in the Galilee. John, I think it might be Mount Arbel, it might also be the Mount of Precipitation. It might also be um, uh, Mount Tabor. We don't know. But in any event, he was standing, it says in Matthew 24, uh, Matthew 28, he brought them onto a high mountain. And what did he say? All authority, all power and authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, Go into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you even unto the ends of the earth. Someone once said they think that one of Jesus' disciples was a Chinese man called Lo, because Jesus said, Lo, I am with you even unto the ends of the earth. Guys, this is the authority that the Lord gives us. The first Adam, it, Paul says, uh, 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 because of the first Adam, many were made uh, unrighteous. But because of the second Adam, many were made righteous. We follow with that same authority that the Lord gave his disciples. And that authority, I think, is a, uh, it should be in the footsteps of the, the man that we've been speaking about today, Paul. Paul had an authority. He had an authority, but it was based on his own flesh, putting confidence in the flesh. I started off giving a, a number of examples of different authorities. Have a look around you do a soul search. Even in our churches, sometimes the authorities, they may start out well, and then when man and his, uh, his uh, confidence in the flesh or his you know, overzealous mind or over uh, too much intellect, it takes over like that book, Dr. Frankenstein. What starts off as good can turn into a monster, a system. Systems don't love. Systems do not love. These systems have to die. 
Paul had to die. He had to put to death the works of his confidence in the flesh. Now, there were times that he, like Moses, when he threw down that rod, there were times that Moses, sorry, that Paul picked up his Jewish background. When he gave his testimony sometimes, he said, I am a Hebrew, I am a Jew. He used it for God's purposes. And so what he's doing, he's putting the horse before the cart, before he was the cart, before the horse. And once he got the Lord in place, and I love what he says, and let's just finish again with those words from Philippians chapter 3, where he says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, and, and notice he says, what things were gained to me, they were helpful for him. But again, remember, he was putting confidence in these good things. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but done that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. And then he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. To the church of Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 3.18, listen to what he says. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Isn't that interesting? He's basically saying, if any man is big, let him become small that he may become big. Amen. Amen. Wow, Aaron, thank you very much for that. Very blessed, very blessed. Um, there's so many things that came to my mind as you gave your, your message this morning, especially correlates to um, a study in Matthew that I'm doing right now and everything is just so enlightening and so insightful. Thank you so much. We want to open it up for um, questions and comments now. Uh, so I'm going to see about unmuting everyone. <laughs> see if I can do it. <laughs> uh, give me one moment here. And I know that people have been using chat, so that's very helpful as well, everyone. Uh, let's see. Everyone is able to unmute themselves, so um, I'll ask you all to unmute and uh, go ahead and speak up if you have anything you'd like to say or chat. Five minutes. Okay. We hear you. Anybody have anything? Oh, Aaron, um, uh, what can you define concision? You said beware of the concision. Well, my understanding is the concision were a group of Jews who were zealous, who were the righteous ones, who the who were basically they were a group believing they were the true um, zealous ones serving the Lord, and. Uh, and Paul was actually part of them at, at one stage. He was, um, he was following in their kind of, uh, in their zealous way. Um, but basically, you know, in, in the Greek, it, it, it basically means an incision. Someone who is, um, has been um, incision, a, a part of a sect, a sect group. And this sect group, they were kind of almost like the most radicals. 
the circumcision party. Yeah, the circumcision party. Thank you. Uh, see anything else from anyone else? No questions? Uh, let's see, there's a, a chat message in here. We already, oh, we already took uh, Shalom and Torah. Can you explain the authority of Moses when he put down the rod? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Uh, this is my, just my own interpretation, you know, um, like I said before, that rod, I mean, what's a rod, everyone? A rod is a, it's a stick. It's nothing. It's like, uh, that's it. But God, that, that's what the Lord said to Moses. What is in your hand? Okay. Okay. You've got a rod. We're going to use that rod. First, throw it down. And the, the, the serpent appears. And, and I remember, remember Moses was... He had a, a short fuse. And remember, at one stage, we saw the serpent behind that rod. God told Moses to speak to the rock at one stage, but Moses used that very gift in a wrong way, in a fleshly way, and he struck that rock. Okay, by the way, there's nothing wrong with striking a rock. Bedouins today, if they want to get water in the desert, they strike rocks and they can get water. There were times God actually said to Moses, strike rock. But at that instance in the book of Numbers, he said, speak to the rock. But Moses was angry. So he used that gift in a, in a fleshly way, in an angry way. So the serpent got in. And I, I, that's what I think. I think the Lord is saying to Moses, Moses, that rod, be careful. The serpent is right behind it. You pick it up at the end that doesn't bite. That's why he said to him, pick it up the other end. He picked it up at the other end. It's the end that doesn't bite him and it doesn't bite others. And I think when we, when we exercise our authority in a wrong way, in a very authoritarian way, uh, I don't think, you know, it's like, it's like um, when the disciples were arguing who was going to be the greatest. Um, you know, the Lord made it clear that he's not interested in those that were looking for greatness. He was looking for people that were going to be childlike and who were going to be the least. And that's, that's, in a, that's the Lord putting it in a different way. He's saying be least. And that's what Paul became. He became least. He learned to lay down all of his gifting, all of his talent, all of his background, all of his cultural background. And there was so much richness there. But uh, like I said, he didn't put confidence in that. He used it when it served God's purpose, but it didn't get in the way of uh, the spirit of God. I hope that, uh, that uh, is understanding, uh, understandable. And on that very same rod that turned into a snake, later budded, correct? What was the significance of that? Um, was that Moses' rod that budded, or was that Aaron's rod that budded? Well, is that rod not in the, in the Ark of the Covenant now? I mean, wasn't it left in the Ark of the Covenant? I assumed it was Moses, but I'm not really sure. I think it was Aaron's. Was it, was it Aaron's, anyone, or was it Moses? It was Aaron's, right? It was Aaron's, yeah. right? It was it was Aaron's. Yeah. Yeah, I stand corrected. No, no, no. That's fine. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I believe it was Aaron's. And and my understanding of of Aaron's rod that budded was there, there was a challenge on his authority, and so the Lord told uh, the the leaders to get to everyone to lay down their rods from the tribes and uh and in the morning it showed that aaron's rod had budded which was an incredible how that can happen uh and that was showing the people that that was like god's mark of authority on uh on aaron and in a way in a way this is this is kind of what 
Um, I don't know if it's, you know, maybe it's not a good analogy, but in a way, Paul, he, uh, he budded. He really budded. He, he, um, he lost everything. He laid down everything because there was, there was people challenging his authority in the church. I mean, at first they were afraid of him. You know, they heard, isn't this the one that was persecuting us? But um, uh, God approved uh, his authority. So, um, yeah. But first he had, to, he had to lose everything. He had to, you know, he had to go through those many, many years, at least 17 years of being a nobody, um, reevaluating his theology reevaluating his whole lifestyle. I mean, what a shocking experience for Paul. You know, one of the things, I don't know if anyone's got an insight into this, but when the voice came uh, on the road to Damascus and he was blinded, remember what Paul said? He said, who are you, Lord? Yeah. And I've often wondered, he actually calls him Lord. But he didn't know who he was. So he knew it was the Lord, but he just, he said, who are you, Lord? I don't know if anyone's got any insight on that. I, I've, I've often thought about that. What, what, what was behind that question? Sometimes actually, sometimes I, I ask when, 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 um, when the Lord is doing something new in my life or something that he allows something that I don't understand, uh, sometimes I'm tempted to say, Lord, what are you doing? And it's another way of saying, who are you, Lord? I don't understand what you're doing. But uh, this, is, uh, this is our walk. We get to know the Lord, uh, the different aspects of the Lord, the, the providing Lord, the, the Lord who goes with us through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, hey, Haran, couldn't, uh, couldn't he be asking if it possibly was an angel? He was a Pharisee, so Pharisees did believe in angels, so he knew there was someone of power, and he just needed an identification as to who that person might be. And the other thing that came to my heart when you were speaking was 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away, and the new has come. So I think that that he spoke that that was he became that new creation when he finally believed in Jesus, and he was passing that on for us. Amen, amen. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, I uh, I think I'm pretty sure when he called him the Lord, I think in the the Greek, uh, kurios. I don't believe that he was addressing him as an angel. I think he really was addressing him as the Lord. You know, I think if we had it in Hebrew, it would be uh, the yud heh vav -Hey, Jehovah, the Lord. Um, and yeah, that's my understanding. But who knows, maybe... Uh... Um, anyone else? Comments? Questions? Um... There were a few things that I wanted to to mention, um, Aaron, that brought that you brought to mind in your teaching, and just as you were speaking right now, um, with new things that are coming along in life, and and we're 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 fearful, we're scared, we're doubtful. Is this really you, Lord? And in uh, Matthew 14, for example, when when Peter stepped out in faith out of that boat, in uh, Matthew 14, uh, you know. Uh, 28 and 29 where peter asked him lord if it is you command me to come out on the water uh, is this you lord what do you want me to do and jesus said come to me step take that step of faith trust me um just just know that i am know that i am lord and i am there with you and i've got it and that reminded me also of when you spoke of uh, moses and that inanimate object that rod God can do wonderful and amazing things with the most simple, inanimate objects in our lives. And he's got that great will and plan for our lives. And for all these um, great people that we've seen as examples in the, in the Bible, Moses, Aaron, all of them, 
Um, and he's constantly showing us examples of that, taking that leap of faith and just knowing that everything is according to his will and plan. And um, yeah, and then and that brought to light too is, um, you know, Paul was raised in the in that Roman world where the Romans and the Greek they were all very very carnal, uh, very very physical, and and it and it truly was in a, a society of, you know, it's all about me, it's what I want, it's what I feel, and and just carnal desires and everything, and then comes Jesus and. He, he helps them to retrain their brains and rethink the world and how they do it and how they interact with it. And, um, you know, in Matthew chapter five, where you have all the blesseds, and then he counters those in authority and the leadership and says, you have been trained this way. But I say to you, you know, he's, he's retraining them and, and, and helping them to rethink those things and and it truly is a matter of the heart you know we let go of the the fear and the doubt and the selfishness and 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 know that that god is there with them helping them and and, and re-educating them and and he set the example he was so awesome he set the example for all these amazing things to heal and to cast out demons and and then he gave us his believers those in faith he gave us that authority like in matthew chapter 10 where he um you know called his 12 disciples to go and do likewise and his followers and those that have jesus truly in our in our hearts um we have that same authority and we can do great and amazing things with those inanimate objects like like a rod <laughs> you know what you're saying gina is so powerful because um, to renew our minds. For example, you know, the Greco-Roman world, they lived in the now, in the material, they worship the material. The Judeo-Christian, as I mentioned, it's to worship the unseen and for the believer, for the Christian. Where to, what did Paul say? Our true citizenship is in heaven. Talk about having to renew our mind you know, when, and, and look at the day and age that we're living in now. You know, one of the words that has been coming to me quite strong in these last few days, remember Lot's wife. That's Amen. what the Lord Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot? They were fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord gave an authority. You know, the theme of our Bible study is authority. <laughs> He said, don't look back, okay? And she looked back. Now, why did she look back? It wasn't just looking back. Obviously, Chris, no. her heart was gripped with things. There were things that she, her sentiments and her emotions were connected to something back home, whatever it was. And God said, don't look back. And she looked back. She became a, a, a testimony, a testimony. When everyone sees that pillar of salt, like when you go down to the southern part of the Dead Sea and you see the pillar of salt, Lot's wife, it's a testimony. And the Lord says, remember Lot's wife. I don't know if that word is applicable today, guys. Something radical is happening in this generation with this virus. Whether it's a real virus or not is a different matter. But there's, there's a breakdown in the society that we've known all of our lives. And will it be the same when the dust settles? Will the world be the same? Will the monetary system be the same? I got friends, um, Sandra, in Australia, where you are. Maybe you can say a word or two. Are you still with us or did you go back to sleep? <laughs> Are you there? No, I think she went to sleep. I'm going to have her. I'm going to give her a hard time next time. <laughs> Those Aussies. I thought they were tough. <laughs> but you know what? I've got a friend living there, and she says I think there's like about six states in Australia, and I think most, or well, no, not most of them, but a few of them have now become cashless society. They won't take money anywhere. 
And this is a problem, especially for people out in the in the farms, out in the deserts. Because, you know, Australia is the same size as the United States. People live out in the middle of nowhere and they need money. They don't even have credit cards, but they're pushing for cashless society. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm tempted. I've got no work. I want to look back. I, I, where's my work? Where is it? And it's like, well, for now, I can't look back. I got to move on. I got to look on. The moment I start to look back, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. So, um, yeah, renewing our mind, listening to what the spirit is saying in, in our generation, in our day, um, it's, it takes work. And, and I think this comes from what Paul said, I want to know him. We got... I'm feeling challenged. You know, this this virus is a blessing in disguise for me personally because I'm really um, getting my own house, my own life in order as far as my relationship with the Lord. You know, I've been very busy, very busy for years, but I know where uh, there's been areas that I've neglected that, that those altars, uh, spending the, that time with the Lord. It's not easy when you're busy, but... There's always an excuse, you know? So, challenging. Thank you, Ron. All right, well, again, thank you for your message today. Um, God's truly speaking through you today. And, and uh, oh, I could go on. You and I could be engaged all day long in this, I know. <laughs> but thank you very much. So, um, all right, Aaron, would you go ahead and close us in prayer then, please? And Lord God, we we are humbled at your word, Lord. We, we think of what Isaiah said, are you not a high and lofty God, but you also dwell with him who is humble and contrite in heart and who trembles at my word. And uh, Lord, these are this is a kind of a, i'm i find this a heavy message lord i find this really sobering and um lord i just thank you that with you there's grace with you there is uh your your love and your mercy lord. and uh we thank you lord for um the the fellowship of your sufferings and the power of your resurrection that we can definitely know you as a living Savior, as the second Adam, the one who came to purchase our redemption, the one who gave us the robes of righteousness, the one just like the loving Father clothed the Son with the robe, the ring, the shoes. And Lord, we thank you for the authority that you gave him in that story and that you give us, Lord, and uh, not just the power, but the authority, Lord, as well. And we, we, we thank you, Lord, that the, the more we, we do not put confidence in the flesh, uh, the more free we are just to be uh, who we are. And that is just your children. And with the gifts that you have given us, and we don't have to perform, Lord. We can just be ourselves childlike and yet mighty, powerful warriors, Lord. I pray for everyone listening here and everyone that's going to be listening to the recording, Lord, that you raise us all up and that we would take that authority, that we would know who we are in Christ. Amen. That we would, that we would take that baton, that rod that you, you're given us and we would heed those words, all power and authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go. And we want to go, Lord. So we want to take the, the, the armor of God, the, shield, the sword, the belt, the shoes, the helmet, the prayer. Lord, we want to take that. And we especially, Lord, the, the, the hope and the love, Lord, the weapons of hope and love to a, to a, a world that is, there's so much fear out there, Lord. And Lord, I, I pray for all of us that you would help us to deal with the anxiety and the fear and the spirit of this age. Lord, you said men's hearts will fail them 
for fear and for the things on the earth. So Lord, help us rise above this and then take this message of hope to a, a world that is drowning in, in fear and uncertainty, Lord. We are your body. We are your bride. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself, Lord, that we would all rise up in this hour. Lord, this is not easy. This is a challenge. But, Lord, we know that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. And we thank you, Lord, that you are our great high priest and that you're ever living to intercede for us. You're praying for us, Lord. We, we thank you that you are in the heavenlies, that you are seated uh, at the right hand of God the Father. Thank you that you are our high priest. We are not alone, Lord. You've given us the comforter. You've given us the Holy Spirit. You've given us the power. You've given us your word, Lord. We thank you. So bless my brothers and sisters. Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha, Ya'e Adonai panavalecha, v'yichonecha, Yisa Adonai panavalecha, v'yasimlecha, Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give us all peace, Lord. We crave that peace. We thank you that you said, my peace, I give you my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.